All right, well, again, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. I know today is an important day because we are moving another step ahead. You know, you all have received admits from UT Dallas, so the big question is what next? There is a lot of excitement on both sides. I know you are excited, we are excited here. You know, there are a lot of current students who are in anticipation of meeting you all. They're waiting. We have our program staff, we have our program managers, we have our faculty. Everybody's excited because you're going to join us very soon. And I'm sure for you, it's a personal milestone. It's a it's a big decision to start a degree program. So there's a lot of excitement that's there. And we want to make sure that all your questions are answered so that you smoothly transition into coming to UT Dallas, into the program, and you're, you're set for success right from day one. The agenda for today is very simple. We'll take you through some of the steps which we feel are the next important ones for you. Now, this might differ from person to person. You know, of course, transitioning into a degree program can have additional uh, needs depending on your, you know, who you are and where you're coming from. But what we are going to discuss today are some of the things which are related to the program that you must do. On top of it, if you have questions, you know, we can talk separately, we can talk during this call today, but what we'll do is we'll spend the first 20, 25 minutes talking through these points. In the meantime, you can start putting your questions right away, or if you want to just wait until the end and then ask your questions, that's up to you. We will use the chat so that we are able to moderate all the questions and make sure that as many questions as possible are answered. The other thing is you don't have to paste your questions multiple times. By posting them the same question multiple times, they will not get answered quicker. They will get answered in the order we see them. And trust me, we will answer all the questions uh, by the time we end this webinar. So this particular session is meant for students who are going to start in summer or fall of 2023. So either semester works. We will put a recording of this, so don't worry. If you have to come back and revisit it, it will be on our YouTube channel, the school's YouTube channel but we'll also have this sent over to you just so that you have a record of it. All right, the first thing before we get started with anything at UT Dallas, once you have an admit, is acceptance. We need to know that you are accepting it because for us internally, our systems also need to know that you have accepted and you want to come to UTD. As some of the institutions may charge you, we don't have any seat fee or any confirmation fee or any admit fee. Acceptance is free. All you have to do is go to utdallas.edu slash accept and accept your admission. In the letters that you have received, the same instructions are given, but I want to allay any fears about seat fees and all. We don't have any. Catalog is it's like a contract. A catalog is nothing but it's a collect. It's a document that lists out all the courses that you must complete, all the requirements you must complete before you get the degree. To every student when they come into the uh, into UT Dallas, this is the binding document that tells us that okay for you, what are the requirements that are listed? Now let's say you are in the program and next year the requirements change. It won't affect you because you are on a catalog which was there in place when you arrived, and after that we made changes. So those changes don't apply. However, if those changes are favorable and you feel that that catalog helps you better. You can always move forward into a new catalog. You can't move backwards, but you can move forward into a new catalog. Like for example, uh, a few years ago when we made some major changes into the catalog, we changed our requirement of core classes or how people take electives. At that point of time, some people wanted to just stay in the current catalog that they had and some wanted to move to the newer one. So we will leave that decision to you. Of course, every time a new catalog in, is announced, we share that information with all of you as to what has changed. If you feel you want to move, you can. But the bottom line here is this is a binding document. Now, every student has up to six years. Well, nobody takes really six years. But in those six years, if the requirements change multiple times, you will not be bound by those requirements unless you move to that new catalog. So. That's the link, and you can find that this link on our program pages as well, where it will straight away take you to the catalog. And we'll put this in the chat also so that you're aware of it. The only thing to remember is some students who are starting in summer 
are bound by the catalog that is released in the fall semester of 2022. So whatever if we release catalogs every fall. So fall 22, spring 23 and summer 23 are on one catalog. However, fall 23 students will be on a different catalog because the new changes will come in at that point of time. Any kind of vaccination requirements. Now TB tests. If you're an international student, you have to do that. It is necessary before attending classes. You cannot sit in a class without a TB test. Without a TB test, the results out and the hold removed. OK, it's it's by state law that you must. Get your TB test done and the hold removed before you enter a classroom. So please do not try to circumvent this in this requirement. Uh, you cannot do this, and especially for international students. You cannot do this test in your home country. You must do it at UT Dallas or at any of the designated centers that UT Dallas has. If you go to the Student Health Center website, you will find all the information out there as to how you can go about this test. Uh, you can also book your slots before you're coming here. Uh, they do offer a lot of slots, so plan your travel accordingly. Don't try to plan your travel two days before the start of class, and which also is an important thing because you don't you want to settle down. You want to make sure if you're traveling from an international location, you are settled, you are acclimatized. Sometimes people in the very first few days have issues in terms of adjusting with the new environment. You know, it could be just change of water, change of food. So you need to give yourself time. I would strongly recommend that do arrive at least two weeks before the start of classes so that you're able to settle in well. And when you do that, all your orientations will be covered. Do not miss any of the orientations. OK, a lot of times people we feel that, OK, let's save some money. And you know, there might be a very minute difference between two different flights. OK, and you're like, OK, let's let's go ahead and save some. But to be honest, you're missing out on very important information. Some of our students who have had challenges over the period of time, we found out one of the common factors was that they missed several orientations where very important information was given. You know, reading something is one thing, but sitting in an orientation and listening to people is another thing because you can interact, you can ask questions as well. So I would recommend please plan your travel so that you are able to attend all orientations in person and at the same time all your TB tests, if they have to be done, they are done before uh, the start of classes and your holds are removed accordingly. A uh, meningitis vaccine is mandatory for people who are below the age of 22 on the first day of classes. So if it is summer admits for you, the date is May 24th, 2023. Uh, for the fall admits, it's August 21st. Both of these dates are the first day of classes. If you're not 22 on these two dates, then you must take this vaccine and submit your uh, record of vaccination to the registrar's office. Now. You can take this vaccine in your home country. Uh, be, please do speak to your doctor, your medical practitioner, whosoever you go to. Make sure that they advise you about this vaccine in case there are any complications or there are recommendations that you don't you should not take this. You must communicate that with the registrar's office beforehand to see if there are any alternatives. This is not something that we govern at a program level, but it is done at the university level. But the, the See, the, the thumb rule is that anytime there is any kind of vaccination that you have to take, just consult your doctor first to be aware of any complications that that may happen with you. And then accordingly, keep the authorities here informed. Holds, this is one thing that you will see and you'll probably be uh, a little more anxious about it as the enrollment dates are coming in. So when you look at a hold, it's a tile on your Orion and you click on it. It will have a description of what the hold is and it'll also list out the email address of who can remove those holds or who can work. Who's the contact point for those holds? The program, us, MSBA. That is myself and Sevia Leventhal, who's our program manager. We cannot remove any holds because we don't put any holds on your account. The three major holds that you will see one is enrollment advising related hold. Now, if you have attended yesterday's orientation and you've watched that, advising will take care of those holds. JSOM GR advising at UT Dallas at is the one that needs to be contacted. Any health center related holds, health center at UT Dallas. Now, 
You might ask them to remove your TB test hold. They will not remove it. No holds will be removed until the requirement is met. What they can do is they can probably shift the start date of your hold so that in the early days of your registration, you are not impacted by a hold being on your account. So let's say, let's take the TB test hold. Okay, Health Center is re responsible for it. That hold automatically gets added to international students the minute they are enrolled, the, they are, the minute they are admitted. So what the health center might do is they might just push it to say end of July or early August at the start date of that hold, which means in this period starting April or right now, if you are registering for classes, you will not have issues because your hold is in the future. So when you request these places to to do anything with your holds, don't just ask them, please remove them. Nobody will remove it until the requirement is met. For example, the same thing happens with missing documents. You know, your official transcripts or your official attested mark sheets might uh, not mark sheets, but uh, your degree certificate might not be here. Nobody is going to remove that hold. They may just move it by a few weeks or a few months so that you can register now. Now, remember, this is a one time deal. People will not continue and perpetually keep on moving your hold. So any hold that you have, make sure that you are working on getting that hold removed. If there's a requirement of documentation, if there's a requirement of transcripts, degree certificate, you are providing that to UT Dallas as soon as possible. They might give you some leeway for the first semester, but let's say you have not taken care of it for several months. After that, your second semester, they will not go, they will not remove that hold. If you are an international student and you're in your home country, you are at the best place right now to get all of this taken care of. Now, some of you might just be graduating from your undergrad institution. That's understandable. OK, uh, you will have a provisional degree certificate. You go and submit that. That's understandable. If you're getting your degree after a year, that's understandable. Let admission at UT Dallas know about that and they will take care of your case accordingly. But if you're somebody who has graduated, years ago and has their degree certificate and transcripts or whatever it is, you are required to submit them. OK, slightly wordy slide because there's too much to be done here, but. These are some of the courses that we recommend you take in the first semester. Now these I'm are not going to hop in. You aren't sharing your slides. Oh, I am not. No, sorry. Oh, I am OK. I thought I was sharing them. Did I just stop sharing them or did I never share them? It, it popped up at the very beginning and then maybe when we were both trying to hit record, it went away, but now you're good. All right. Okay. All right. Well, just for the sake of our recording, I'll just move through those slides so that we have them on record. So we talked about no fee for accepting the admit. We talked about the catalog. The link is right there. We also talked about our, the TB test requirement and the meningitis vaccine. We talked about the holds just now. So these are the email addresses for the different holds and you will see them on your, or I'm under your hold section. Finally, okay, so. I'm glad that I said that it is, this is a wordy slide and that was like a trigger. So thank you for letting me know. OK, so the first semester courses. These are some of the courses that we recommend, but these are not mandatory courses, not all of them. Like you might decide to take database foundation in, a, in the second semester, not a problem. However, if you're going to take any course, the database foundation is a prereq. You cannot take that course until the third semester. So that's where looking at all the possible courses that could be prereqs. These are some of the courses that we recommend that you take because if you're going for data science, data engineering or any of the see this is analytics. So any of these three courses are going to be like the. The base courses that you're required to finish. Just a second, let me. Share this again. Okay. 
So if you look at uh, database foundation, that's one of your courses, then uh, 6356, which is business analytics with R, or 6383, which is modeling for business analytics. Both of them uh, count for the, the modeling part. Uh, the difference between the two is 6356 is taught using R, 6383 is more focused on modeling using Python. Now, none of these classes explicitly teach you R or uh, Python, so some basic understanding is required. Yes, there are. They, they start from basic topics, but the expectation is not to teach you the programming language per se. The expectation is to teach you modeling. Uh, 6359 is your advanced statistics class for a lot of courses that we have advanced courses. This is a prereq and we just need to make sure that we are taking this prereq, uh, this course in the very first semester because a lot of course that we know are related to this one. Now, you can take any course that doesn't have a prereq in the first semester. A lot of your electives don't have prereqs. So for example, courses like uh, robotic process automation, SAP analytics, uh, there are a few AWS related courses, cloud computing. These do, they don't have any prereq and you can take them in the first semester. Any course that has a prereq, you must take the prereq in a semester prior to taking that course. So let's say there is course A and course B. Course B's prereq is course A. You cannot take them in the same semester. You have to take A first, and then in a subsequent semester, you take B. However, if for course B, A is a core, that means A can be taken along with B either in the same semester or a semester prior to you taking B. So that is something that you have to uh, make sure that you look at when you look at a course, look at their prereqs and corex, and that will help you understand if they can be taken together or not. Excuse me for popping in again. I think the people are not able to see with the new way you're sharing. Some are, I think maybe the people who are as guests and not signed in through their UTD account are not able to see it. I'm not able to see my screen. Yeah, some are saying it's visible. Some are saying it isn't. Hmm. Let me try another thing here. OK, let's do this. Hopefully everybody can see this now. All right. In terms of uh, some of the possible options that you can have for the first semester, now all of you in your admit admission letters, you may have seen that there are some courses mentioned that you must take in your first semester. Those are called program prerequisites. You don't have to do them before you start your program here. You do that in your first semester. And one of the courses that is listed for sure for everybody is MAS 6102. It's the professional development course. It's mandatory in the first semester. And if you're an international student, 99.99% you must take it. There, is, there are very rare cases where it is waived off. Some of the criteria to waive it off is that you have two plus years of work experience here in the US. There is a possibility somebody may have done that and you know, they are an international student. However, domestic students also, even if you have work experience, you will still have this on your admission letter. There is a way to get it waived. But honestly, if you're trying to pivot your careers, I would strongly recommend not waiving it, even if you meet the criteria for waiver. But that's one class. The other one is OPRE 6303. This is the qualitative uh, business analytics class. This is for students who don't have any calculus background. It has to be taken in the first semester. Now, these courses will be listed on your admission letter. The only way you can waive them is the MAS 6102. There's a form for it, a waiver form that you fill out. If you meet the criteria, you do it. If you're an international student, don't do it because possibly will not be meeting the criteria unless you do. However, 
Bowen 6312, which is your applied econometric scores, 6320, 56, 59, we discussed about that, but then some of the other courses, electives that you can take that don't have prereqs and can be taken in the first semester. And again, this is not an exhaustive list, but some of the popular courses, robotic process automation, web analytics, uh, SAP cloud analytics, organizing for business analytics platform are some of your choices. Now you can take up to two courses outside of the business analytics program. So something that's not on our catalog, but is part of another program. Like we have IT management, we have supply chain, we have management science. And if you like a, pro a course from them and you like to take that, sure, by all means, you are allowed up to six credits, which is two courses worth three credits each that you can take outside of the business analytics program. For domestic students, you can take any of the courses available, you just have to make sure that there is you, you look at the prereq and the corex and accordingly take them. As I said, MA 6102 is mandatory in the first semester, but you can wave it off by filling out this form. We'll put the link in the chat momentarily. And OPRE 6303 is mandatory in the first semester if it is listed on your admission letter. Remember both these courses, 6102 and 6303. 6102 is for one credit, 6303 is for three credits. Both of them do not count towards the set, the 36 credits that the program has. The other thing is OPRE 6303 cannot be waived. If the, if the admissions team, if the program has determined that you must take it, that means we have gone through your coursework to determine whether you have that calculus background or not. A 6102 can be waived off. Again, as I said, not recommended. All right, international students, you can also take any courses provided you take care of the pre and the corex. You must enroll in at least nine credits. If you're an international student, you must enroll in nine credits. You can take one OW class and OWs are the online classes. So at least six credits of the nine should be face-to-face -face courses. Um, let's say you decide to do 12 credits in a semester. Well, then you can take up to two online courses. So six credits are still face to face and two of them are online. Uh, online courses, which are the section suffix is, is uh, OW. These are 100% online and there is an additional fee of $80 per credit hour, which means if you take an online class for three credits, you'll be paying another $240 for it. As I said, MAS 6102 is mandatory in the first semester. If you qualify for the waiver, feel free to look at what the waiver criteria is. Fill this form out. As I said, OPRE 6303 is mandatory, and both 6102 and 6303 do not count towards your 36 credits. They are on top of it. The calendar, so the university follows a universal calendar. Every department follows this. This, hence, we make sure that our dates are in line, or they are in sync, and that can be found at this link: utdallas.edu/academic/calendar. Calendars of upcoming semesters are already there, so that if you need to plan a year ahead, you can do that. And the fee payment deadlines for you, they will be listed on your Easy Pay portal. That's the portal through which you make your payments. Now, you don't have to pay for the entire year at once. All your tuition is gauged after you enroll in certain credits. It is a, it's on a semester to semester basis. And once you have your uh, you know, courses enrolled in, you will be issued a statement based on what courses you've taken. It all depends on the credits. We'll spend a couple minutes looking at how the tuition rates really work so that you have an idea. We also have a financial planning webinar that talks about all our tuition rates, you know, how how do you manage your expenses? How do you finance your uh, degree? How do you fund it? All that there is an uh, there's a comprehensive webinar for an hour that's posted on our YouTube channel. We'll have that put in the chat as well so that you are aware of uh, what we discuss in terms of your financial planning. But all your dates, all your uh, invoices, any receipts, anything that you may have related to your tuition will be on easy pay. And if you have questions around your tuition and all, you can always reach out to the Bursar's office. That's Bursar, B-U-R-S-A-R, Bursar at utdata.edu. This is a very chatty group. 
So we do chat with our students who I am. This is it's another medium. Our program has an official uh, Telegram group. Now this is not our first method of communication. We'll always send you emails, but just for your IMs, we have uh, Telegram. So this is the link for it. T.me slash MS UTD MSBA. Just find us, join us. And if you have questions, you can just post them. Th this group has people from the program who are current students, prospective students, and myself with along, along with our uh, business analytics leadership council members. We make sure that you know your questions are answered there. Uh, we talk about application process. We talk about program related things, housing and non academic related questions. We don't discuss on this group. If you have those kind of questions and you want to reach out, please just send me an email and I'll connect you with the right people. Uh, the other thing is when students are coming in, they end up creating a lot of unofficial WhatsApp groups, Telegram groups. Feel free to do that. You, know, you can you can create whatever you want to create. But from a program's perspective, this is what we have. But email will still be our number one thing. And email to your UT Dallas email. So please start using your UT Dallas email. Once you receive the admit, we will always talk to you only through your UTD email. So. OK, some golden questions that we get all the time. Which courses to take? Now, that's a that's a very basic and very elementary yet very important question. Which courses to take? Some of the courses that we tell you, uh, you know, we'll make recommendations. Your, your catalog tells you what are your core classes that you must complete, and then it gives you a, a sneak peek into your electives. So you can decide what you want to learn. The other way of doing this is, let's say you have a, a you have a purpose in mind as to what kind of roles you want to get into, and when you think about those roles. Every role needs skills. Skills need training. So one of the things that I recommend to students is maybe look at those roles that are out there that you want to do. Let's say you want to be a data scientist. You want to be a data scientist at Microsoft. Go to Microsoft's website and try to fix, see what is the job description for a data scientist at Microsoft. But at the same time, look also what the data scientist does at Google, Tesla, Amazon, Meta, I mean, whatever companies that you want to work for. Make a list of all those skills that they they have there. And when you have that whole backlog of list of skills, you will see some skills you don't need because you already have them. You're good with them. Some of them might just need a refresher. And then there are some skills that you have no clue about. Now see what courses we have where those skills can be used or, or gained. And accordingly, let that help you take courses. It's good to seek people's advice, but don't just blindly take courses because somebody else is also taking those courses. Make an informed decision. See, this is something which requires thought. Your success will depend on how less haphazard you are with your approach and how planned you are with what you're doing. If you put some thought around things, if you plan things out, they are easy to manage. What professors to take? One thing that we can do is, you know, we can we can see what courses there are, read about those professors. You know, their profiles are always there. But when you talk to people and they give you a perspective about which professors to take, remember it's a person, it's an individual feedback. Somebody may have had a good experience with an instructor, and they might end up talking to you and tell you it's a good instructor. Somebody might have a bad experience with somebody. Bad experience in the sense they just didn't do well in the class. That's the only thing that can happen. And guess what will happen? They'll, they'll blame the instructor that the instructor wasn't good enough. Remember, in the same class, we have people who get A's and we have people who get F's. People who get F's will not go back and tell you, well, this was the greatest instructor ever. It was just me who screwed it. So be, be careful about where you're getting your advice from. Always ask what makes you say that this is a good person or this not a not so good person. And don't just. Don't just employ somebody else's thoughts. Spend some time. You're spending a lot of money to get this degree. You are spending a lot of time and energy and so many resources that you're not even aware of right now that are going into this. So you can't use a 10 second conversation, a minute long conversation to just 
make a decision as to what is good and what is not good. So calmly think about that. So that's one another place. Um, do I need to complete all core courses first is another very famous question that we get. No, you don't have to. Nobody says that you must. We recommend that try to complete them as soon as you can, because let's say in your final semester, you have to fly out to another city to do an internship. And you have a core class left and there's no online seats. You're stuck. Because when you and we'll look at, as you can see, the next point talks about what are the criteria, what is the criteria for graduation? You must complete your 36 credits, 18 core and 18 elective. It doesn't matter if you have taken 40 credits, 44 credits, 48 credits. If you haven't finished your 18 credits score, core credits, we will not uh, move ahead and, and, and uh, help you graduate. You will not graduate from the program. So that's why we say try to finish the core classes as soon as you can, but there is no mandate that you must do them first and then only you can move on to your electives. Can I take courses outside the MSBA program? Absolutely. Six credits, which is two courses of three credits each, are allowed outside of the program. There are a handful of courses that we don't let you take. Like, for example, we all MSBA students are required to do uh, one six three three twenty, which is the database foundation for analytics. We also have a a slightly uh, a lower version of that course called another database course, which is at a lower level. That is for non IT, non IS students. That's allowed in their program, but we don't want you to take that. We want you to take the, the advanced course. So if you end up taking that course, you can sit in that class, but you will not get credit for it. Similarly, uh, business analytics students, they do advanced statistics. There is another flavor of statistics that we have, which is more geared towards non IS, non IT people, non analytics people. That is good for their program. If you end up taking that, you can take the course but you'll not get credit for the degree. Uh, the criteria for graduation, as I said, 18 plus 18 is what you need. Your GPA should be at least a 3.0 in your core classes, and your overall GPA also should be a minimum of 3.0. Now, should this be always above 3.0? What if I go below 3.0? Not a problem. If you go below 3.0 in your uh, overall GPA, you'll be put on probation. You know, you can be on probation for two semesters, but in that time, you have to get out of probation and to stay in good standing. If you don't get out of probation in two semesters, because well, at that point of time, uh, program dismissal happens. But here and there, sometimes, you know, for whatever reason, students get on probation, but they you can always get out of it. OK, your uh, GPA in your core classes. Now that might not factor into your probation immediately because we only look at overall GPAs, but at the time of your graduation, we look at your core GPA separately. A 2.9999999 is not 3.0. It has to be at least 3.0. Third thing you have to do is at least do an internship or practicum. Practicum is a three credit course. If you don't get an internship, we bring in a few companies to do projects with you. That's what the practicum is. Internship is when you work with a company. A lot of people think, uh, oh, can I do an internship or a co-op? Well, for us, it's the same thing. There's no difference between the two. Okay, you can, uh, you can do your internship for up to three credits. Your first internship, if you have not completed the practicum, your first internship can be of zero credits. So there's no obligation for you to uh, pay tuition if you're just doing it for credit once. But let's say you want to do uh, you want to get credit towards your internship for multiple semesters. After the zero credit one, you'll have to do at least one, two or three credits. You can split your three credits across multiple semesters for internship, or you can take all of them together. That's up to you how you want to do that. But you get through those three, and those three are counted out of your electives bucket. So if you do an internship, then you're left with five other electives that you have to take. When, how soon can I finish the program? The fastest you can do. Let's say you get your MAS 6102 professional development waived. There's nine months. International students who have to do professional development, it'll be 12 months. That's the fastest you can do because you're bound by an upper limit of 18 credits per semester. That's the max you can take. We don't recommend it, but you can take it. And the max is 72 months, which is six years. Nobody takes 72 months. Most of our students take one and a half to two years, which is three to four long semester, which is 17 to 22 months. 
a few of you who might be doing dual degrees might add another year on top of it. People who are working part time and doing this degree, you might do it in two, two and a half years. But I would say between one and a half to two and a half, most of our students end up finishing their program. How when can I start an internship and what can what kind of internship can I pursue? Well, if you're an international student, you need to complete at least two long semesters. Summer is not a long semester. Long semesters are fall and spring. Once you complete two long semesters, you're eligible. And you can only work for up to 364 days. Now, whether it is continuous or it is broken down into multiple internships with breaks in middle, the maximum number of days you can work on your CPT, curricular practical training, as an international student is 364. For our domestic students, you know, one internship is, is enough. If you want to take credit for multiple, you can do that. There's no upper limit in terms of the number of days that you can work. Uh, but irrespective of your status as domestic or international, the internship has to be such that it can be tied back to the courses you have taken, not the degree program, courses you have taken. So for example, the, the business analytics degree also has cybersecurity courses. Now, you're talking about cybersecurity, and tomorrow you get an internship as a cybersecurity intern. And you can't say that because my program has cybersecurity, I'm doing this degree. The question will be, did you take that course? If you've taken that course, then absolutely, you can do that, uh, uh, the, that internship. The other thing is mapping your courses to your internship is very important. As much as possible, have that. You can't say that, oh, we once had a one hour lecture on. I'm just thinking of a topic blockchain. OK, one hour. And now I'm doing a full blown internship on blockchain. There has to be other things related to your job, your internship that is related that can be mapped back to your courses. And there is a possibility to do that, but just don't say that there was one topic and now you're doing a full internship on that. That that doesn't make sense. Also, for international students, you might have uh, you 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 may end up saying, or, or even for domestic also, that I have prior experience for something and now I'm doing an internship right. No, did you take courses? in the program and now as a result of taking those courses you're working on an internship see the goal of the internship is that you have gained some skills in the programs and you're putting it to test if you say that i'm using my prior experience only my prior experience to do this job then it defeats the whole purpose of an internship but uh, with that i want to quickly share again our details our contact details with you our emails are listed but between myself and Sylvia, we have the ability to either answer your questions or direct you to the right person who can answer your questions. OK, before I go to the chat to look at what you guys have posted there, I just have a few things I want to show you quickly and we'll have these links also posted. So the catalog, this is the current catalog for fall 23 students. This is going to be a slightly different catalog, but this is how the catalog looks like. If you say, OK, what are the courses that I can take to learn about data science? Well, you look at the data science track. You don't declare any tracks. There is nothing that you say, oh, I need to declare that I'm doing data science. Your degree, irrespective of what you do, well, is going to say Masters of Science and Business Analytics. It is nowhere going to say that you have data science or you have data engineering or uh, social media analytics, nothing like that. It's the same degree that you will get. The other thing is, especially for international students, there's a checklist. This is a great checklist for you to keep track of what you need to do post and pre arrival. Use this and, and you'll be ha you know, very uh, happy in terms of managing all aspects of your arrival, what needs to be done before or after. If you need to request an I-20, there is uh, a page that talks about requesting I-20s and how you can go about it. But one thing that I did not pull up here prior to us talking was the tuition plans and rates. Now, another question that comes is, should we go for variable or guaranteed? That's up to you, but I'll just tell you what the difference is. Variable rates will change every year. There's about a 2% increase every year. Guaranteed rates for as long as you are at UT Dallas for that program, the rates will be locked in. 
Now, var variable rates start at a slightly lower level than the guaranteed rates. But students like yourself who will complete this in two years, you really don't get very affected by the variability of the variable rate. So a lot of students find the variable rates being cheaper for them, but this is again a decision for you. You can decide which one is better for you. So once you, once you click on, I'll just go through the variable rates right now. How do you go about looking at your eligibility as to what your tuition will be? So let's say that you have to take nine credit hours. The first few columns are about undergrad, so you skip this, that, you go to graduate. The thing that matters in terms of determining your tuition is two things, your residency and the number of credits you're taking. So let's do nine credits. So nine credits, if I'm a Texas resident, my fee is going to be 7,544. The same thing for a non-Texas resident and international students is 14,626. That's how you look at it. Now, another thing to know is after 12 credits, so you can see after 12, there's a tuition cap, which means whatever you take after 12 credits, credit number, technically credit number 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, you can only take 18 credits. Those credits are free of tuition for you. Now, it's not a recommendation that you must take it that, because there are too many courses, but if you're planning that ways, that's how you can save some money. Similarly, for non-residents and international students, you know, anything beyond 12, it's at 18,000. This is your base tuition. On top of this, there is a $100 per credit fee, which is the school fee. So if you take 900, uh, sorry, not 900. Uh, if you take nine credits, there is another $900 that are assessed for residents, Texas residents. So your fees will be 7544 plus 900. So 8444 is your tuition. Similarly for international, it's going to be 15526 because it's $100 per credit. On top of it, international students are required to take health insurance. That's about $1,400 a semester. Please do not try to wave it off. I mean, you can, you can show similar coverage and you can wave off, but UTD's plan is really good. I would personally recommend that, but again, that's your choice. Which one you have to take? You must carry insurance, period. Uh, for domestic students, it may not be mandatory, but I'm sure that in some way you are covered. If you don't have insurance, you can buy UTD's insurance. It's about $1,400 for fall and spring, and then for uh, summer, it's $550, 533 about 550 Right below this table, they have mentioned the school fees. So the $100 I was talking about for all graduate students is right there. I'll just quickly check on the guaranteed rates piece as well. So you can see it's it's in the same range. There's not much difference, but these are locked in rates. So what was 8544? Is that correct? Nine credits. 7544 has become 8544. So it's about a thousand dollars more there. Similarly, for international students, it was 14, 14, uh, 526. It's about two thousand dollars more there. So guaranteed starts at a higher rate, but it stays the same. That's why I said most of the a lot of students find the variable tuition plan much cheaper for them, but it's your decision which one you want, we want to take. I just wanted to make sure that you have this. Um, some other fees and charges that you might be facing. So student health insurance, they talk about it. Um, 1389 for fall, 1371 for so approximately 1400 and 550 for summer. Now, if in the second semester you become a TA, or an RA, not master students are mostly TAs, they're not RAs. This is paid by the university. You get paid a thousand dollars after taxes, plus your health insurance is paid. Um, any kind of late fee, in terms of loan payment, your tuition payment, all of that is there. And in case you want to go with housing, meal plans, all those details will be found right here. Again, this is your 
this is something you want to do. Um, one good thing that you might be able to use is tuition estimates. So if you click on that, and for prospective students, if you want to get a statement, let's say some of you ask it for your banks, you can just fill this form out. It's a self-service tool. So select graduate, let's say you're non-resident. I'm just assuming it's an international student. Uh, we don't have the option for fall, but let's say we do spring. You pick a variable, pick up your mm -hmm. school. And let's say you want to do 12 credits. And you submit it. It's going to tell you what your estimate is and it you can print it. Some reason the print button is in there, but is not working. We'll get that fixed. I make a note of that. We'll have that fixed. Okay. Well, that was what I wanted to share. I'm going to quickly now start taking a look at your questions in the chat. Please, let's put them in the chat. Uh, that's the best way for us to manage them. Okay. Good number of questions. That is great. Let's see. The very top. Thank you for all the uh, links that you posted, Sylvia. Um, which vaccine is this? This was the meningitis vaccine that I was talking about if you're under the age of 22. So Jahid, uh, how do I take OPRE 6303 if I did not take a calculus course? Is, it there, is there a way to waive it by taking it online? Well, you have to take it here at UT Dallas in your first semester. Again, it will be listed on your admission letter. If you say that you did not take calculus, there's a high possibility we'll have you would have seen that and we would have put it on your admit letter. But any program prerequisite will be mentioned on your admission letter. Please read your admission letter very carefully because it has some very good information as to how you can get started. So we'll have that all listed there. What's the difference between CoREC and PreRec? Well, CoREC can be taken with the course, as I said, in the same semester. A is the CoREC for B. They can be taken together. A is the prereq for B. A has to be taken in a semester prior to when you take B. That's the difference. Many courses show prereq or coreq. They should, so they also need to be done after the prereq course mentioned. Yes, whenever you're looking at prereqs and coreqs, you're looking at the course that is, let's for example, I'll give you an example. Big data, no hypothetical examples. Big data is a course that requires database foundation as a prereq. So you must take database foundation in a semester prior to taking big data. OK, sorry about the screen uh, going away for you guys. OK, I'm just keeping all of those notes here. Is there a sample plan for two? Is this a sample plan for two semesters? Not really a sample plan. See, we are a very flexible program. We let you decide how you want to go about your Courses. We will just help you in terms of building that plan, and we do that a lot. In fact, this is the week when the enrollments are opening for our students, the, the current students as well, and we're doing something called advising pods. We are helping them with their questions. They have all sorts of questions about how do we uh, order our questions. Uh, sorry, how do I, how do you order our courses? Uh, which course will help in X kind of a career that I want to pursue? So there are qualitative questions. There are courses around planning, and we help you with that all the time. So don't worry. The other thing that I want to tell you is, yes, do make a sample plan for yourself, but you will always change your plans once you start your courses, because once you start taking courses, you get an idea about what all is there to be offered and what you really like. Sometimes you're not even aware of things that you really like taking until you get into one or two classes and that opens your eyes towards all the new possibilities. So those plans will also change as you move forward. Uh, are those two additional courses limited to JSOM or can I opt it from any place in the university? Well, if it is outside of JSOM, we'll need additional approvals. If there is relevance to the program, we, there is a high possibility that we will approve it. If it is not, then we cannot. For example, very recently, one of our students wanted to take some course in music. Now, there is no connection of music and business analytics. Yes, people can uh, argue that, you know, but the qualitative nature of music has nothing to do with analytics. We could not. 
But then there were some students who wanted to take a stats class from the School of Mathematics. There is relevance, so we approve that. It, if it is within the School of Management, it's easier to get that approval. In fact, there is no additional approval needed. All you have to do is you, you can ask the advising or us whether this course will count. I will tell you whether it will count or not, and that's all you need. How do I check whether an elective has a prereq or? So when you look at the course description, it will tell you what the prereq or the corec is. If you try to enroll in a course whose prereq you have not met, you will see an error, which will tell you that you haven't met the prereqs. Uh, since OPRE 6303 is not counted towards 36 credits, does it count cost extra? Absolutely. Now your tuition is not for 36 credits. Your tuition is always for the number of credits that you take. Let's say by the time you reach your final semester, you only have three credits left. One thing is you can just take those three, three credits and be done with it. Or you might say, oh, I need to take three more courses because I like taking those courses. Sure, by all means in your graduating semester, you can go beyond 36. We will assess the number of credits that you have taken. That's why when you take the zero credit internship, it's zero credit. It gives you technically it fulfills a requirement, but it's zero credit, so there's no tuition associated with it. Uh, that was a good question. The tuition is dependent on the credits that you take rather than, well, will this count towards my degree or not? What's the total estimated fees for MSBA and what's the per credit hour? The, so the per credit hour answer cannot be given because that all depends on how many courses you take, what's your residency in that semester. Let's say first semester you have no scholarship, second semester you have an intern, uh, uh, a TA ship, your residency changes. By the way, TAs pay instead tuition fee. Um, so the total estimate, I would say the the uh, the range is forty to sixty five thousand dollars, depending on all these scenarios. Now, right below this question. Uh, say we posted the financial planning webinars link. Please go to that one because we have only and only spoken about the different scenarios that you might encounter from a financial perspective and how do you go about them. Um, can you give us a I can't see the link to the Telegram group. So that was I posted. posted it right in below. There. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, can you give us the count regarding student registrations for concentrations? Well, there are no concentrations per se, but uh, we had a big class last year. So Flex had about 650 students. We generally used to get about 350, 400 students. See, we are a big school. We can accommodate them. And the reason why we have so many courses is because we are able to structure a program in a way that students can take those classes. When we have so many students come in, it's not that you're all sitting in one section. For example, students who have to take database, we had 18 sections of databases that were running throughout the week. Uh, there were 17 sections of uh, st stats that was running. There were 14 sections of BA with R that were running. So we always have multiple sections. Every section will have 40 to 60 students, depending on uh, you know which course it is. Generally, our electives, have, I would say, will hover between 25 to 50 students. Our core classes are 40 to 60 students. Um, so even if you come with five, six hundred students, they're not five, six hundred students in one class. OK, moving on. Is the internship mandatory? Absolutely, it is. Can core credits be taken from different courses? I did not get that. You the core for business analytics is set. It's the six courses that you must take. So, OK, I understand. You mean can you take it from different programs? Not really. You have to take it from business analytics only. And there's a reason why we have that core, because here is the thing. We want to make sure you learn analytics and we have figured out some courses that you must take to gain that skill set. Now, some of those courses might be challenging, but guess what? Analytics is a challenging field. It is a very high paying field. It's one of the top most paying fields. And yes, the skill sets that that are required there are some skill sets that require some challenge. But at the end of the day, when you go and work in those companies, you are one of the top people when it comes to analytics because nobody has gone through the training the way you have. Does uh, working for six, 364 days affect the OPT? No, 364 days is your max. You max it out, that's it. 
you're not affecting OPT at all. What is the minimum GPA to continue the scholarship for third or fourth? So for third and fourth semester, uh, to, you need to apply again for second year. As a continuing student, you can apply every fall and you need to have at least 3.35 GPA to apply. Are we eligible for scholarships in the third four if we are admitted without GRE? Absolutely. As a continuing student, we don't look at your GRE or GMAT. Is it mandatory to take minimum of nine credits every semester? Is it only for first? You have to take it every semester unless you're doing a full time internship, which is 21 hours or more per week for at least 11 weeks. And uh, or it's a, it's your graduating semester in your graduating semester. If you're left with just. Uh, two credits, three credits, you just take that. You just want to make sure you take one course, which is face to face in your graduating semester and uh, internships. If you're using internships to reduce your course, there's something called reduce course load. You get that approval from ISSO. They put it on your I-20 and then you can take less than nine credits. For health reasons also, there are three, four different areas, but the number one is internships and then health reason and then a couple more where they allow you to do reduced courses. Domestic students, till the time you're taking one course, you're good. All right, we are at the top of the hour, so I will try to cover as many questions as we can. All right, Hari Priya, what if we received an internship, let's say in cybersecurity, but was planning to take courses related to an upcoming semester? It's like saying that I will drive a car first and then I will learn how to drive a car in a driving school. You must say your learning skills and then you're putting them to uh, to work. So you must take the courses before. All right, somebody has unmuted. Uh, I would recommend if you can mute. That will help us. What else? Um, where can I find where can I find the study plan that's mandatory for embassy interview? Well, if you need that, just send me an uh, an email if your embassy requires it. Not every embassy requires it, but if yours requires it, I will send you one. And in that request, also give me a few courses that you will be taking. So I can put that. Where can we see the catalog for fall 23? It will come in the next couple months, I would say. So sometime in June is when we release the catalog. Your yes. core requirements have not changed. Just a moment. OK, your core requirements have not changed. It is only a few electives that we have added. And again, you can take those electives even without changing your catalog. You don't really have to change your catalog always. OK, where did I go? I think I've come too far. All right, let me see. The last question that was put in was for 9.31 AM from Prajwal. That would be our last question, but I'll come cover all of them before that. OK, so what do we have? What's the criteria for merit based scholarships? Well, if you're an incoming student, your entire profile is required. We do look at your GRE and GMAT, and they are not the only criteria, but they are a good way for us to kind of compare two people who have studied at different universities. It's a standardized test, so it helps us engaging your academic abilities somehow. But your essay, your letter of recommendation, your resume, everything counts. Can you get scholarship for both years? Yeah, you can. If you do well, you can get continuing student scholarship as well. Do professors prefer students without scholarship for TRA? Well, I hire TRAs for our department and I don't double dip. I make sure that if you've got a scholarship, we don't pick you for a TA or RA ship because there are benefits for both and we, we want to spread the wealth. However, having said that, if there is no possible candidate because a TA ship is a job, if, th if there's no candidate that fits the bill, other than somebody who has a scholarship, then at that point of time, we'll go with somebody, but we try to keep them separate. What is the GPA required to get qualified for Dean's Excellence for second year? 3.35 is the minimum, and then it all depends on the pool. Does the variable tuition plan include insurance? No, the plan, the table I showed you was just base tuition. On top of it, $100 per credit for the school, and then insurance is separate. That's why I'd use the tuition estimate link to uh, to figure out what your tuition will look like. What are major changes from 22 to 23? Well, uh, as I said, it will be available in a couple of months, and mostly we have added more electives. 
If I've been awarded resident status through Dean's Excellence Scholarship despite being international, which rate? That's up to you. Mostly the variable plan is the one that ends up being cheaper for students, but you can do your calculation and decide which one you want to go. And as I showed you, that uh, guaranteed definitely is higher. Where do we check the insurance amount per semester? Well, that will be on your easy pay and the link, the tuition rates link that I showed you also will list uh, the health insurance rates there. Can we take more than six electives during the entire course or is six the maximum? You can take beyond 36 credits in your graduating semester. Are the six credits that we can take from other courses included? Yes, you can. So out of the 36, you can have six credits from outside of the MSBA program. Can I take a prerequisite course prior to joining? Uh, one moment. All right. Can I take a prerequisite course prior to joining the program in summer, or do I have to take uh, it during the semester? Well, anything which is a prerequisite, a program prerequisite, has to be taken in the first semester. What is the supplemental fee? Hundred dollars. That's a school fee. Every school gets to charge their supplemental fee on top of what the university has. It's like ima just imagine a fraction of your fee instead of giving it to you as a total fee. They've broken it down into university and school components. I have enrollment hold on my account. I've sent an email to but no action has been taken. How long does it take? Well, give them some time. They generally respond in about three business days. And if it is around advising, we just had the advising orientation yesterday. So the next few days, our advisor will be working on removing the holds. Uh, how many courses do you recommend in the first two semesters for a student with scholarship based on stats? Five plus four or four plus four? Here is the thing. You're not here to rush through your coursework. Uh, having said that, I don't mean to say that you cannot take a lot of courses. You can, but think about it this way. If you put pressure yourself at too much courses. Because you you have a scholarship, you want to save money and all that kind of stuff, and you end up doing poorly in those courses, it will not benefit you. It's unnecessary stress that you have. You should think from a perspective of what will help me learn better. Three is the minimum load. Three is a good load as well, because there are so many things you do outside of the class. If you have no time to spend outside of the class, you're going to get affected in the long run. You will save money but you'll be impacted. People take four. OK, sure, four is fine. But if four is non manageable in the first semester, come down to three. The other thing is in the first semester, you're getting used to a lot of things in a degree program. So don't overburden yourself with too many courses. My personal recommendation is three. You really want to stretch, take four, but don't go beyond that. OK, how many minimum credits can be taken? When do classes start for fall 23? So. As an international student, nine. As a domestic student, one course is enough. And classes start on August 21st. Is there a fee apart from tuition fee, insurance, supplemental fee that you need to pay per semester? Uh, if you're taking an online class, there's $240 for a three credit course. I don't see there is any other fee that would be there. Um, there is an uh, international student's fee that's about $150, but I. I don't think so. There's anything on top of it. Again, the bursar will be sending you the statement which will list the breakdown. What are the prerequisite courses for MSBA? There's no prerequisite. There are program prerequisites in terms of uh, your uh, professional development and OPRE 6303 in case you have not taken calculus before. When do I register for classes? You can go into Orion and see your appointment. Now, the way the appointment works is if you're closer to graduation, you'll be given priority. Else you'll be the very, you know, in the appointment week, uh, sorry, the enrollment week, you will be on the third or the fourth day generally. It it has it doesn't put you at a disadvantage because you have too many courses that you can select from. If you want a certain course in the first semester, you don't get it. It's an elective. You'll always take it in the second semester. As far as core classes are concerned that you can take in the first semester, we try to make sure that you have enough seats. So between now and the start of classes, we don't open all the sections together. We look at wait lists and we slowly and slowly start adding course sections. How do I apply for scholarship? Uh, we will put the link in the chat, but it's on the Jindal website through which you can apply. 
Can I get on campus employment? Absolutely. From the first semester, first day you can. Once you're enrolled, your handshake profile is automatically activated and that's where you find all on campus uh, jobs. You don't have to create a profile for yourself. Do not get into the business of creating it because that will uh, result into the activation process failing. The activation works if the pro profile doesn't exist. So have some patience. Do not uh, create your handshake profile. And as you're enrolled, you will see that uh, it will be uh, activated. Uh, can I-20 be revised after getting scholarship and after visa acceptance? Yes, you can do that. Absolutely. Again, if you, let's say you have not got an I-20 and you got a scholarship, your I-20 amount will be lesser, but you got the I-20, you are yet to appear for your interview and you got your scholarship, get a revised I-20 because that will list the scholarship as well. Sometimes they ask, how, you, how are you funding it? You can say that you got a scholarship and it will be listed on your I-20. Um, can you please show the slide about placement details? Well, right now we were talking mostly about our uh, uh, enrollments, how do you get into this? We definitely have all the data on our uh, business analytics website. All reports are there for each semester, for each year. I would strongly recommend that you go into our, our uh, bus uh, business analytics website to see all the stats about people's jobs, where they are working, what roles they're taking, what are the salaries, and we'll have that link put in the chat so that you can look at all the placement details. Um, Bhuvan 6345, well again, if it's a cross-listed course and there are two types of codes to it, you sit in any of the classes that will count. For example, uh, STATS has Bhuvan 6359 and it is also offered by Operations Management as OPRE 6359. You take either of the classes, it means the same, it will count the same way. Can I get a rough cost estimation for 36 credits? As I said, depends on your residency and your credits. 40 to 65K is the range. And please do watch the financial planning webinar. When can we expect the scholarship results? If you've not heard until now, May 1st is a deadline, and these results should come within a couple of weeks. Like by mid-May, I am assuming that all the results will be announced. Is a bank loan sanction letter enough to issue? Yeah, that shows that you have funds. So if you get that bank letter, that is good. You can have your personal funds, you can have your sponsor funds through your, your parents, siblings, relatives, plus your own savings, plus the bank letters. Does the guaranteed tuition estimate include medical? No, it doesn't. None of the rates include it. They are uh, sub supplemental. Is per credit rate higher for summer semester? Yes, how much? Is very, there's a slight difference. And again, the tables are with you. You can check it yourself because how many credits you're taking, it will all depend on that. Plus, you know, there are tuition gaps as well. So honestly, for you to really get a sense of it, I would recommend going to those tuition tables and looking yourself. There are three semesters in a year, correct? Can subjects be taken in summer? Yes, you can. Now, as a continuing student, so people who are starting in summer, you must enroll in summer. But once you're done with that, if you're a continuing student and summer semester is there, you don't have to really enroll. There's no mandatory enrollment required. I want to get into finance. Do people get opportunities? Absolutely. Analyt See, analytics is a common denominator for every industry. Every industry is driven by data, and that's where you have analytics. Should I-20 amount reflect the bank statement's exact amount? Can it be less by a few dollars? Now, how few dollars? Uh, what's the range? Try to, if it's some a few dollars, see, they need the amount that they're asking for. It's 36 something for scholarship recipients and 51 something for you know non-scholarship recipients. Round it off to the next thousand, 52 and 37, and send it. Can I take MIS in the first semester? You can, there's no prereq. 6380, can we change the track later on? You don't declare a track, so you don't really change a track. It's up to you. You can take all your electives from one track. You can take it from multiple tracks. There are 10 courses mentioned in the core. Only six are enough to meet. There are 10, uh, like, again, it's uh, stats, database foundation, 
be with our or modeling for business analytics, prescriptive, predictive analytics, and uh, econometrics. So those are your six. Each credit will be how many hours? That's not the way. Every course is three credits. It's three credit hours. Can you explain about the deferral of program and result on my scholarship? Now, if you defer, you can defer up to one academic year. Not a problem. Your admission is guaranteed if you defer by one academic year. However, your scholarship is not guaranteed because if you defer, your scholarship doesn't get deferred. You have to apply again. Maybe the second time you don't get it because every time it's the pool that matters. Uh, do we apply for scholarship every year or every semester? So as a continuing student, you can only apply in fall semesters. In case I miss a class, can I take a different session under the same class in the same week? Well, that depends on whether that instructor is teaching it or not. And it also depends on whether that instructor wants you to do uh, to do it or not. It, it depends. Uh, have a chat with the instructor and they might be able to. Students do it here and there, but it's a discretion of the instructor. I have mailed the registrar regarding the hold on uh, meningitis vaccine. How long does it take to push? Generally, within a week, they should be able to verify your certificate and remove that hold. When can we start working as an intern? So as an international student, after two long semesters, as a domestic, we look at at least 12 credit hours to make the determination as a domestic, but for international, it is too long semester. Are there any clubs active or part time jobs on campus during summer? Oh yeah, there are. Don't worry. We have lots of events happening, summer camps happening during summer, which require student workers. Clubs are also active. Um, I'm aware it depends on the individual, but on a percentage, how many students end up taking 12 credits against nine? Well, this is not something that we uh, I would say. At least. 30 to 40 percent students do that, and again, this can change. This can remain the same. It's not something that we really track that why students are taking more. What we have seen over a period of time is the sh there's a shift in the number of credits. What used to be nine has now become 12. But then to, by taking more credits, you know, I would say. People are kind of a little more pressured because of that, and they realize that in in subsequent semesters that they shouldn't have taken 12 credits. Can I avail more than one JSOM scholarship after the first semester? It's just one. You can have a second scholarship that comes from a non UTD source and they can give you additional money, but UTD is just one. OK, I want to be me mindful of the time. So I'm just extending a few more questions. 9.46 a.m. Saurabh Jadav is the last one that I'm going to take. If there are more questions after that, we will entertain it over email. So just FII. I'm going to just part it so that I remember that was the last question that I'm going to take. Uh, can you provide uh, your assessment on the feasibility of obtaining a 3.0 GPA while taking four courses. People can do that. That's not a problem. It's up to you. You know, you can go beyond below 3.0 by just taking three courses also, two courses also. And you can, we have seen students who take six courses and are four pointers. So it all depends on a, a person. What's the duration of the CPT and OPD programs and how do they differ from each other? CPT is your curricular practical training before your graduation. You can only do it until 364 days. Uh, uh, for a total of 364 days. OPT is post graduation. It's a STEM designated program, which means after the first year you get an extension of two more years to work on your student visa because you have that authorization. In case an individual fails to maintain a 3.4 in the first term, would they be permitted to complete it in the subsequent? Yeah, you are. You are not immediately terminated. Let's say after the first term you, you are on probation. Now the only thing will be that you cannot enroll in classes yourself. You'll have to do it through advising. You'll have another semester to get out of probation. Let's say the second semester also you at the end of second semester, you're still on probation. You will get one final chance. To come out of probation. If you don't, there will be academic dismissal. And that's why we make sure that we talk to students who are on probation to ensure that they have their planning done right. And they are aware of how they can go about. Uh, you know getting your uh, uh, coming out of probation. 
What's the criteria for merit based scholarships? Well, if it's merit based, your GPA, what you have done, but there are a lot of donor scholarships where they look at your extra curriculums as well. I applied for JSM scholarship on March 6th and I didn't get any decision. Well, it depends on where you are on the pool. The committee looks at these applications every week, and if they don't select you, they don't reject you. They will do that all the way until mid May. After mid May, they will give you a final results as to whether you made it or not. Should I raise a new I-20 post getting a scholarship? You should get it because that will have your scholarship listed on it. The rates on variable plan change due to what factors? Well, inflation is one factor. You know, it's like you do a job, you get an increment, right? So that keeping costs in mind because the cost change, inflation will push the cost, and that's where uh, the tuition also gets impacted. Can you comment on the job packages opportunity? When should I start applying? Great question. First of all, you don't have to apply before you get here. You don't have to start applying on day one. Get here, get settled, see what is there, get into your classes, acclimatize with the place, and then start seeing what your career resources are. If you take a couple months to just settle and then start applying, not a problem. Do not get pressurized by the fact that you must apply to 800 places. You must apply before coming here. Nobody is going to hire you in the very first week of your you starting a program. Nobody is going to hire you before you come to the program. So do not pile down under that pressure that you have to do everything. There are enough people out there that will tell you you must start applying from the get go. No, are you ready to even apply? Now, I'm not saying you have to perpetually wait, but give it a few weeks. Get settled in your courses. You don't want your courses to uh, get hurt. We have a good number of students who have offers right after two or three months. But guess what? That's all they did. They didn't take care of their courses. They're on probation. If you're on probation, we can't approve your internships. So you have to be mindful of what you're doing. So I would say don't stress too much. Do not tell yourself that you must do it from the first day itself. If you don't do it, then you're behind. Not really. But see what is required to get to a point where you need to do this. Apply for jobs. Now, there is a possibility that you know you need to polish your resume, your LinkedIn, and the other things. You know, get your business card, start networking with people. All that takes time. Don't wait perpetually. Don't be like, oh, I need to wait for an entire year before I get ready. Well, none of us are ever ready. But I would say get started well. Get get into the driver's seat well. And then you and it takes about a couple of months to really do that. So spend that time judiciously and you'll be good. Um, if the supplemental fee 100 per credit, then if I take 900 uh, nine credits and it is 900, yes, that's how it works. How do we access Handshake app? So if you just go to our career management or just uh, Google Handshake UTD, you will get that link. But don't create your profile. Your profile will be automatically created and activate it after you enroll. Um, I am a fall 23 student. I have asked. Uh, I was asked to send a courier of my transcript to the Jindal School by any chance. Can I submit my transcripts after coming? You can. Uh, you just make sure that they are in sealed envelopes. They're attested copies. Please don't submit originals. Whatever you submit will not be returned to you. So to never ever submit originals. Copies which are attested by your degree or transcript issuing institution body in sealed envelopes and all the seals are stamped. You can drop it in our Dropbox or you can have them mailed to us. I would recommend mailing it for a variety of reasons. What if they are not accepted? For whatever reason, mostly they are, but if there is something wrong, you while you are in your home country, you can just go ahead and get another copy. Just, just a word of caution, nothing else. Financial webinar link has been posted. Or you can go to the YouTube channel of Naveen Jindal School and you'll find it there. When will I get a normal I-20 after getting a scholarship I-20? There's no scholarship I-20, by the way. I don't call it that. It's an it's I-20 itself. OK, just that scholarship is listed on it. So once you get your scholarship, if you want to request it again, uh, they will reprint your I-20 with that note that uh, you have scholarship funds for the handshake portal to be created what needs to be done no your, your enrollment is required that's what i've been trying to say 
Your enrollment into courses is required before you can do anything. Can we get any assistantship opportunities as an incoming student to help with fees? So you can work as a student worker on campus. You can't be a TA in the first semester. Looking at the economy, there are enough job opportunities. Absolutely. This economy is not just US, it's the entire world. And what we are seeing is more and more jobs are opening up. Remember, one of the things that we saw was a lot of people who got laid off. There was reasons around skilling as well. Skill was one of the top reasons. So that's why when you come to UT Dallas, your number one focus should be skill building. And that will really help you. Our students, or our top students, had no problem with any of the layoffs or anything. Uh, you know, sometimes businesses close, and that could be another thing. But when we kind of we, kind of, we surveyed some people to just see what were some of the reasons quoted, it came down to skills a lot. What's the maximum limit to defer my admit one academic year? If you do it beyond that, you'll have to reapply. Is there any portal to connect with seniors? So there is. Uh, thank you for asking that question. We have a connect with a student link that will be posted in the chat. You can connect. You can fill that form out and you'll be connected with current students. All right, will declaring funding through a bank loan only cause problems with the visa process? Not really. Uh, again, showing multiple sources always helps because it shows that if one source fails, you have something to take care of on the other side. But if you have just one source, there's no problem. Till the time you have a good explanation about what you're doing, you should be fine. Uh, Prabhu, thank you so much. OK, just in the spirit of answering all of them, I'll take Shruti and Prabhu's question there. Um, in the second year, if we have only 12 credits left, can I take six per semester? So you have to mandatorily take nine credits unless you have received reduced course load authorization because you're doing a full time internship or you're in your graduating semester. And can we email our transcript your institution? Which is the degree awarding institution or your uh, the, the institution, your, your university that awards the transcript, they can through their official email addresses send scanned copies which are attested to admission at UT Dallas. We'll accept that. OK, that was not bad. We ended up covering all the questions. We thank you so much, guys, for uh, attending this and talking to us and asking all these wonderful questions. We will have them. Uh, we'll have this re recording of this webinar on our YouTube channel, but thank you so much for all your questions. Please join our Telegram cha channel as well because you can keep on asking questions there. And I cannot tell you, we are so excited. This is an amazing time of the year where, you know, we know that you guys are coming in and this happens every year. So you are excited. We are excited. Everybody here is, is excited. And I'm sure this is going to be a life changing moment for you. I am not saying that as a program director, I'm saying that as an alum of UT Dallas, somebody who got a degree from the same department, that that was my best decision to come here and do that. It was a life changing moment for me, and that is going to be the same for you. And it has been a life changing moment for thousands of our alums who are out there doing great work. So we look forward to seeing you. We look forward to your questions, emails or whatever it is. Help. Let us know in whatever we can do to help you comfortably come to UT Dallas. Have a good one, guys, and we'll definitely see you soon. Bye-bye.